a long, hard evening shift of nursing practice in the obstetric gynecology ward of St. Luke's Hospital it is over. I return to my hospital provided housing, one bedroom apartment across the street on Amsterdam Avenue, which I shared with my then first wife, Valerie. I lock the front door, step inside, immediately notice that the place is uncharacteristically pitch dark. It's midnight, but the wife usually waits up for me, then rolls over and goes back to sleep, staying awake just long enough to say goodnight. Oh well, uh, she must be exhausted after a long day working as a librarian at the New York Public Library up at uh, the Hamilton Terrace branch. I, I reach for the light, switch on the wall in the foyer by the front door, when the terrified voice of a tiny, frightened woodland creature hisses from out of the inky blackness of my residence. Mike, is that you? Yeah. What do you do? Don't turn on the light. I was watching TV before and this movie came out. I started watching. I knew I shouldn't be watching it all alone without you here to protect me. But it started out all right, but it got so scary I had to turn it off and turn out all the lights and hide it in the blankets for what seemed like hours until you got home. This movie was so horrible. It was so gruesome, so bloody, so scary, I couldn't even scream. You were watching The Exorcist all alone and you got so scared that you turned out all the lights in the whole house and hid under the covers so that the Mesopotamian demon Pazuzu wouldn't get you? What are you, 12? Don't you have a master's degree from Barnard College? Go to hell, you bastard! You go straight to hell! That movie was really fucking scary! And don't you dare turn on that light either. I'm, I'm still scared, and now you, you gotta come into bed next to me and protect me. All right, you little girl. Big Daddy will protect you from the big, bad booger man on the television. Fuck you, you asshole! I'm really scared, and you can't even stop making fun of me, and I thought you really loved me and cared about me, and now you're acting like a big douchebag and laughing at me, and I'm really, really scared, and you don't give a shit up! Oh, I'm sorry, dear. Don't cry, little girl. Daddy was only fucking with you, honey. Daddy really didn't mean it. I was only joking. I'm here. I'll protect you from the demonically possessed 70s-era preteen has-been actress and future cokehead Linda Blair and a whore fake Hollywood special effects green pea soup projectile vomit. You are such a fucking asshole. Do you know that? I'm extremely emotionally overawed, and you can't seem to refrain from exploiting my misery for your own very special, sick, perverted sense of human can you? Is this how you treat your dying, emotionally fragile patients on your hospital ward? Yeah, I bet you do, you sick fuck you. Besides, I wasn't watching The Exorcist for your information. It was even scarier, more gruesome, and terrifying. This movie, it started out so nice. It was all about this young, beautiful, talented girl, a musician at Juilliard. One day she's at school, she falls down a flight of stairs, starts having an epileptic fit. She's on the floor shaking, writhing around the ground, hitting her head, spitting, foaming at the mouth. It was scary than the exercise. It looked so real. And then they drag her off to this really disgusting, gross hospital. They shave her head, cope her skull, and blood is dripping out. You can really see her brains. And it's Mr. Spock from the Starship Enterprise on Star Trek who's operating her knees, and she's dying, and Mr. Spock doesn't know how to save her life. So he just cuts a huge chunk out of her brain with a butcher knife, throws it down on the operating room floor, and disgusts and tells us medical students uh, to just sew her scalp up and dump her in the intensive care unit with a bunch of crazy old bald black ladies who scream all night long, keep yelling, let me out of here, let me out of here, and cry and roll tight in straight jackets. And Mr. Spock goes, don't do anything heroic for her. Don't do anything heroic? I mean, he's not even going to try to help her? He's, he's just going to let her die? I mean, what is wrong with all you people working in the hospital anyway? Are you all just a bunch of emotionless, soulless, compassionate, robotic assholes? <laughs> or something? I mean, really, what the fuck is wrong with you? Anyhow, how can sick people be in a place like that? It was a house of horrors. I swear I've never seen anything like that in all my life. So anyways... I was so freaked out by that whole movie, I had to turn it off, turn out all the lights, hide under the cover, and wait for you to come home and comfort me, which of course you didn't. You only mocked and tormented me with your sick, fucked up sense of humor, like you always do when something really scares me, so fucking thanks for nothing as usual, dickhead. Wait a minute. Leonard Des Moines was in this movie? I mean, like Mr. Spock? Yeah. Holy shit. That girl was my patient. 
In real life, at St. Luke's Hospital, back when I was a nursing student at Columbia, her name was Kathy Morris. The movie is titled Seizure, the Kathy Morris story. It's one of those Lifetime channel based on a true story, like uh, the Amityville Horror. It really happened. She was actually a student at the very prestigious Manhattan School of Music of the block from here. She developed the meningioma, a tumor on the membrane covering her brain. Leonard Nimoy plays the real Dr. Hutchinson, old Dr. Hutchinson, the cardiothoracic surgeon, not the young Dr. Hutchinson, the gynecology surgeon I usually work with. Yeah, yeah, she used to walk around the ward, that is when she was physically able to walk at all, with a gay, colorful gypsy bandana wrapped around her head to conceal her baldness and the hideous scars on her scalp when the neurosurgeon performed the craniotomy surgery, the burr holes, the trephony, drilling into her skull to release the evil spirits in her brain, man's oldest form of surgery, since the brain has no pain receptors, the Neanderthals performed it, the Incas performed it, and we still do it today, right across the street, only now how we call it neurosurgery. We don't believe in the demon pursuit anymore. That gross, disgusting ICU, that's the Minturn Pavilion, the dumping ground for the terminally ill indigent. It's just as bad as the movie portrays it, or even worse, because the place always has that stench of decomposition and human shit and piss perpetually hanging over it. The whole, the whole movie was shot on location at St. Luke's. And Kathy Morris, she was very beautiful. She was strikingly beautiful. I mean, if you really dig that pale, bug-eyed, hollow cheek, emaciated, anorexia, neurosis, dying from cancer, much too young look of Nicole Richie. Anyway, the real story is not as upbeat as they made it out to be on the Hallmark Channel. You get to see a film, a clip of the actual Kathy Morris, not an actress, performing her own original songs at Upper West Side Nightclub at the end of the movie during the closing credits, but what they left out was that afterwards she got much sicker. The tumor grew back, she would make it, she eventually died at St. Luke's. True story. Well, thank you very much for cheering me up! Now I'm gonna have nightmares all about that dead, poor dead girl all night long thanks to you! You couldn't have told me it was a work of fiction? Lean over the foot of the bed, switch the television back on just in time to catch the movie's final scene where the actress playing Kathy Morris goes AWOL from St. Luke's, escaping the evil clutches of diabolical old Dr. Hutchinson, portrayed by Leonard and Moy, Mr. Spock of Star Trek fame, by hopping on the M11 bus. Again, filmed on location at the bus stop downstairs, outside the lobby in front of my own apartment building at 1090 Amsterdam Avenue. Art imitates life. And life imitates art. No gory Hollywood slasher flick will ever match the horror of daily life. The horror. The horror. <laughs> Don't you just hate it when you're the newly designated health care provider for the FBI and the Bureau, as we in the business refer to them, similar to their investigators or lackeys? as we in the business refer to them over your work site to initiate extensive official background check interviews. Yeah, I just hate that when it happens. So I see that the interrogator was just in here to talk with you. Yes, exactly, the, the interrogator, more like the grand inquisitor of the Spanish Inquisition. I told him before the interrogation began that I reserved the right not to answer if I felt that the question was too intrusive. I, I simply refused to answer. They ask you all the usual questions about your finances. Do you owe anybody large sums of money? Do you have a gambling problem? I really didn't mind those questions. I expected that. But he says, I see here that you are divorced. Would you like to elaborate on the reason for your divorce? I mean, really? Really? I'm like, I really don't believe that's any of your goddamn business. But if you must know, it was because we really didn't like each other very much. Well, Mr. Big Mike, uh, if that really is your true name, uh, I see here you were divorced a grand total of four times! Four times! Would you care to elaborate on any of these? For example, uh, what was the reason for the divorce from your first wife, Valerie? Well, you worship, to be brutally frank, because she was a lying little bitch! That's why, Your Honor! Now, I want you to write that down in your little report right there, your evidence, and I quote, my first wife, Valerie, was a lying little bitch. I want every special agent in the Bureau to read in black and white that my first wife was a lying little bitch. Enter that into the official congressional record. I want the whole world to know that my first wife was a lying little bitch. Uh, excuse me, sir, but uh, these records are all considered to be uh, privileged information, strictly confidential, secure. No unauthorized person will have access to them. 
Not if the red Chinese have anything to say about it, Einstein. Once them sneaky, slimy little yellow rat cummy bastards cyber attack your sorry little lashes in the bureau and breach your firewalls and hack into the FBI personnel computer files and all 1.2 billion mainland Chinese, fully one-seventh of the world's population, will know once and for all that my first wife was a lying little bitch! She lied to an Episcopalian priest, to the company of the dearly beloved gathered here today, and God! when she vowed that our marriage was indivisible, and I quote, till death do us both shall part, and I'm still alive, so what gives? <laughs> okay, 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 look, I'm sorry, Your Excellency, my wife was not really a lying little bitch. I was a lying little bitch. I lied to Valerie, Her Holiness, when she confronted me and asked me if I was screwing around behind her back with her bestest friend in the whole world, Elizabeth Skinner, and I lied. I lied, I lied, and I told her no, when in reality I was banging the living shit out of her girlfriend and fucking her brains out, your worship, so that it actually make me the lying little bitch in our relationship. No, no, no. Uh, the real reason I divorced my wife was that she was a money-grubbing little whore. You got that down there, Sherlock Holmes? A money-grubbing little whore who left me for the first senile toothless old man with more assets than I had. Her new old man, old toothless Stevie, just because he flew her off to Paris and stuck this huge rock on her finger for which she rewarded him with a night of forbidden taboo anal sex, a practice which she denied me for all of our 17-year-long marriage. Like I said, my liege lord, a money grubbing little whore. Well, I see her, your second ex-wife. Why did you divorce her? Oh, the morbidly obese, sweaty, greasy, oily, malodorous, fat pig? But I also see her, Mr. Big Mike, that you've listed her home address as your current residence. Can you explain that? Sure, I just really dig fat chicks. Fat chicks rule! And such low self-esteem. That's just the way we like them. And wife number three, she always maintained that I was in league with Satan, the Illuminati, and those 12 old Jew men living in Zurich who control the world's economy that she read about on the internet one day. So she, she threw me out. She was an embittered, born-again Christian and a rabid anti-Semite. The religious differences between us were just too great to overcome. It wasn't really my fault, as you can see, sir. You were married to a rabid anti-Semite for seven years? Yeah, well, what can I say, your majesty? She had a great set of tits! Besides, I wasn't legally divorced from my second wife when I married her, so technically speaking, I was a bigamist. And the fourth? Oh! The Lower East Side Poetess. I'm convinced she hooked up with me only for the literary fodder I provided her for her third book of poetry. When she was published, she kicked my sorry ass to the curb. And I find myself right back living with my overweight second wife all over again. So I sincerely hope that I pass the Bureau's rigorous audition, Your Reverence. Well, Mr. Big Mike, uh, everything seems to be in order here. Uh, you seem to have answered all of our inquiries openly, honestly, and completely. You should receive your security clearance and your bureau credentials next week. Why, thank you, Your Grace. Limping northbound on Greenwich Avenue in the West Village, immediately identify her strolling southbound. It's been 20 years and more, and I can still pick her out of a dense crowd of anonymous New Yorkers. The Roman nose, the Egyptian eyes of Cher, the beauty mark on her upper lip, just like Madonna, jet black hair of Benny Page, bare, suntan shoulders, and a bando bra. Just like me, she must be in her 50s. She is as slim and shapely as she ever was. Time has not morphed her into some sort of plump, matronly, middle-aged suburban housewife. Not as yet, anyway. Preserving her tulip glass stemware figure and wasp waist, there is mutual recognition on her part. She freezes and as per routine with all these reunions, she momentarily flashes at me that usual ghastly look of abject terror and unmitigated horror etched upon her fright little face as if some long lost dearly departed relative had suddenly returned from the dead to haunt them amongst the living, a Lazarus risen from the grave, great-grand-uncle Mordecai appearing to Tevye the Milkman in a dream, Jacob Marley rattling his chains in the face of Ebenezer Scrooge on Christmas Eve, or Banquo's bloody ghost inviting himself to a seat at the head of the table at Macbeth's feast. Shake not thy glory locks at me, thou canst say I did it. These various women usually respond, You are dead? You're still alive? Upon first seeing me, my one-time ex-sister-in-law, Marlena, merely exclaims, 
Ow! My! God! It's really you! In the flesh, as I live and breathe, alive and well, for the most part anyways, in earlier, happier, more innocent days, we had been an inseparable trio, Marlena, her sister, my wife Valerie, and me, lightheartedly dancing our way together across the length and breadth of the Hampton beaches every summer, and at every hot happening Manhattan nightclub, every weekend, Studio 54, the Red, uh, the red uh, Parrot, the, uh, the Roseland Ballroom, Webster Hall, the Cat Club, Envious Latino playboys, jealous at seeing us three swinging and swaying in our menage a trois ballet on the dance floor, would lean in and whisper seductively inside Marlena's ear, Hey baby, two on one ain't fair. At which Marlena would merely toss her long ebony hair and casually flip him the finger. Divorce changes all that. Friends, relatives, lovers are all divvied up between the correspondence and the legal proceedings like so many mutual, disposable, marital assets. And everybody goes off in their own separate directions. There was a time in our 17-year marriage to her older sister, Valerie, when I could not come unless I fantasized I was mauling Marlena's big, fat, Mediterranean ass, manhandling Marlena's tiny teen tits, and pawing Marlena's own pointy, erect, rosy red fire plug nipples while I was fucking her sister, my first wife. I was all too familiar with the most intimate of details of Marlena's feminine anatomy. I had once been her nurse. She had once been my patient on a surgical ward at St. Luke's Hospital when she was still in her early 20s. Oh my God! I haven't seen you in years! She leans in, bestows a very Italian family kiss on my sweaty cheek. Obviously, my ex-wife hasn't sufficiently badmouthed me enough behind my back to poison Marlena's mind regarding me. Rapid. Well, I did recognize you. I recognized you too right off. I'm working right now on real estate. I'm showing apartments to clients in this neighborhood, so uh, I really can't talk to you right now. Well, I I'm living in the area here in the, in the West Village these days. I really got to run right now, but I'm, it is so good to see you again. Bye now. She hustles off with the potential buyer to resume her life. I hobble off to resume. Yeah. <laughs>